So did the plays we saw give us jagged nerves. <laughs> A nice white family, Mary Jane, her husband Steve, and a son Nick, and a daughter Frankie. You know, they are celebrating like the, she's writing a Christmas nice cards or letters to friends uh, and relatives. But we should say that this is Alanis Morissette's um, Jagged Little Pill that they've uh, they taken her music and shoehorned the story into. And they made a story into that. You know, the music is really good, but okay. So, so she, this seemed like a very, very happy, you know, well to do family with the accomplishments and achievements. And and all that stuff but it's all all false you know and uh, the the one daughter is adopted she's black and she's a uh, you know, goes to college. It's about oh, lots of teenagers. And there are lots of issues in this play. There are so many issues. There's sexuality problems. There's a transgender. There's gay people. There is addiction. There is a lack of communication. Then there is a bad marriage. Who was transgender? There were a lot of people transgender in, in the show, in the it chorus. Wasn't, it, maybe, but it wasn't part of the plot. Yeah, but it was visually there. They were there. All kind of people were there, you know, in the chorus, right? Uh, oh, I, it's I, an I all contemporary I, issues were being dealt with. At no, this see, I did not notice that at okay, all. Okay, well, okay. well, you noticed the gay relationship, right? Well, yeah, that was, the, yeah. Well, that's because it was, you know, that was, that was part of the plot. Okay, that was part of the plot that was to, to, spoken about, but the transgender thing was not spoken about, but they were there. Oh, I, 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 I mean, okay, I, I, well, I, I, whatever, it doesn't it matter, it, it, it didn't bother me, but the problem was, it was so loaded, it was so loaded that the sensitive issues kind of like started to, and was so loud, and it was so badly lit that you had to close your eyes to see this play. How can you see this play with closed eyes? <laughs> you can hear the music. Music is really good. Yeah, but you're but, hearing it with your ears, you know, because it was so loud, you know, so so you, we couldn't understand the lyrics because, and I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not familiar with the Alanis Me too, Morrison I was album. Not, right. So yeah. it's like, I missed all the music and the lyrics, so it's like that was lost on me because it was so loud, I couldn't understand them. Yeah, but you see, beside these two major problems, there was another problem, and that is the length of the play. It is so long that lots of times, you know, the, the okay, there's a chorus, the big chorus, a lot of people. And when the Mary Jane and her household scenes takes place, chorus is still there. It's like a stream of consciousness behind them. I didn't understand that. Well, that's a musical thing. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. but even, like, musicals are rather illogical. But even for a musical, this was beyond illogical. Yeah, but then you could, you got very, very confused. And also it, it increased the length of the play, you know, because there were so many songs seems repetitive to me. I, did I hear that before? I heard it on the other side of the stage. But now that's only because we only heard noise because it was so loud. We weren't able to enjoy and appreciate the music and lyrics because they just made it into noise. Yeah, and then another which issue is introduced like unhappy marriage. Which marriage is not unhappy? <laughs> All the marriages are unhappy and non-communicative. So that issue should have been taken out completely. Maybe OPI is a very important issue and that should have been dealt. But then then I can't tell the ending. Okay, well, I just want to, this is what I said. Mary Jane is writing a perfect family Christmas letter about Steve's promotion and the accomplishments of her adopted daughter, Frankie, and her birth son, Nick. All the time, their actions that are shown to us belie her words. It was a very funny scene. Everyone is so busy hiding secrets and being self-involved that what they have here is a failure to communicate. Everyone jumps to the wrong conclusions to cause unnecessary drama. And all the hot button issues were thrown in the opioid crisis, sexual identity, ethnic identity, Me Too, teen rebellion, troubled marriage. I mean, the acting was really fabulous, but you know. Oh. Yeah, can I say one more thing? You know, this, this girl, Frankie, I liked her very much in the beginning. She was a very wonderful singer. And then, you know, she's gay because she has a lover and the other girl is very good also. And then all of a sudden, she has the hearts for the guy. So I was like confused. You see, I did not get it that she can be bisexual somehow by that. My head yeah, was so you're, tired. When you're a teenager, you're, you're no, not I quite know. sure yeah. where, where, oh, which I, way to go. That didn't come but, across. But, that didn't come across. No, it didn't. But yeah. I'm just trying to explain. Yeah, I know. Like you, I said, this you is are a logical. Nice. You always take 
take well, lessons. You can well, try to analyze it with a also, nice way. Well, you know what was interesting, though, was the fact that, you know, the family, they adopt this black baby, and they're very white. They're the whitest people in the world. And they wanted her to be able to fit in, so they did not address the fact that she was an African-American and maybe and, and needed to be treated as a... She actually wanted to be treated as an African-American, not, oh, we're just going to, like, gloss over that fact and make you feel like you fit in by treating you like a white person. But she's not a white person, and I, wa I don't want to be treated like a white I want to be treated like what I am. Yeah, right. And but that was interesting, because you never think of that. Yeah, you think think she's doing, that. You but think she's doing something, you think the parents are, you know, being good by thinking, well, we're going to let her, you know, feel fit in, and doing just the opposite. Yeah, but you see, this, is the, this is the problem with adoption, because the thing is this, if the parents... Uh, treated her like a black person, then there's more racism comes through. You know, oh, okay, they're treating her as black, but she's black, you're right. That's how they should treat her. But parents also have a difficulty because they want her to be part of this white family. So, so, so they expect her to become the white values, adopt the white values and all that. She's a very unhappy girl, you know. So maybe that was the confusion. She's not, she's with one, with one girl, then she's next day with the guy without explaining anything or anything. And then I said, oh, maybe she just changed from a gay person to a straight person. And then afterwards she said, I'm bisexual. I mean, it was just very, why do they have to deal so much political correctness in the plays now? This is very difficult to, to it's a theater. You know, why do you have to be so right in every issue? There are too many issues now and theater is becoming very, very disturbed because theater should not be, it's, Okay, I'm a little political myself, but it should not be so politically correct. And the thing is, it, I mean, um, you know me, I love happy endings, don't get me wrong, but the, it was forced here. You know, you're trying to put happy endings on rather Everything. unhappy situations. You know, I don't want to go into too much, but it's like, you know... Yeah. Anyway, I always have problems with the happy endings when there are a lot, lot of problems in the middle of the show. <laughs> Everything ends happy. Anyway, you know, but mixed for the because of the unhappy for the situation for the whole what they did with the lights and the noise and everything. But happy for the actors. You know, the actors were fabulous. The yeah, music was good too, but we just could hear it better. Yeah, yeah. like I, yeah. I I said in my review, which you'll see on Facebook, which is. I don't know, because we've been very long here, is that, <laughs> uh, you know, stay home, put on the album in a uh, nice quiet, have a glass of wine, and enjoy the album. Perfect. That, that would be the best idea, yeah. At La Mama is the transfiguration of Benjamin Banneker, conceived, designed, and directed by Theodore Skipitaris. And Benjamin Banneker was an 18th century free African-American man who made important scientific and mathematical discoveries. He created a clock that was accurate for 50 years and devised an almanac. He also speculated that distant stars had their own solar systems. He communicated with Thomas Jefferson, reminding the founding father about uh, Jefferson's own words about equality. This uses inventive puppetry and animation and also has incredible drumming by this group, the uh, Soul Tigers. And, you know, it's sort of like a celebration of this neglected African-American men, but also a celebration of African-American culture and definitely gets a happy face. Tosses is at flea with Joel Gomez's Leaving the Blues, <coughs> which is about the life of blues singer and composer Alberta Hunter, who held great acclaim from the 20s until the 50s when she gave it all up to be a nurse. After not performing for 20 years, she is approached by a Danish television producer who wants her to perform live again at the cookery. Will she go back to singing or just wallow away? The main focus of this play was the closeted relationship between Letty and Alberta. Letty was more willing to risk the consequences of their affair than the trepidatious Alberta. I would have liked to have heard more about Alberta's life and career, but the love story was very moving. Cooper Sutton and Benjamin Mapp did some incredible buck and winging tap dance numbers choreographed by Cynthia Marie Davis. And when Resident Brown, as Alberta Hunter, did get a chance to sing, she knocked it out of the park with the suggestive handyman blues and the heartfelt downhearted blues. 
Even Joy Sawdust as Letty got her own blues song by Toshi Reagan. And Michael Michelle Lynch made a very dapper spirit guide as he looked benevolently on and filled in the narrative. The rest of the cast were equally wonderful wearing Ben Phillips' beautiful costumes and being directed by Mark Finley with panache and sensitivity. So I'm giving this a happy face minus. At Metropolitan Playhouse's Thunder Rock, Robert Audrey's 1939 play, directed by Alex Rowe, and it concerns um, David Charlson, who was a journalist and very much um, committed to the Spanish cause in the Spanish Civil War, who now is retreating to be a lighthouse keeper in northern Michigan, and on some level must be feeling bad about it because he's mind is conjuring up the images of the people who died in an 1849 um, shipwreck. And they're sort of criticizing him for his um, lack of optimism, I guess, and he's criticizing them. It's actually a very brilliant play about history and about, you know, to retreat or to be committed when a time of war comes up. Yeah, because this was d during, during the, this was right. Very beginning. Of World War II. I mean, this is actually written that time. And it's like the, the ghosts were, or spirits or imaginary people he conjured up were sort of like six characters in search of an mm -hmm. author because they were like, they refused to leave. And he was like, he thought he was in control of these because he thought, you're my imagination. And they were like, no, we are rebelling. We are staying until you understand what you have to do in your life to make us alive. Well, again, it's because they're projections of his own inner conflict, basically. So he had to come to a point where he understood what he needed to do. And... This play will make you feel really hopeful about the future, considering what was coming. It just, I don't want to give too much away, but it's like the last act was just so, it just made me like, I'm going to survive Trump because of this play. It's, it's just an important play to see. And it's just, it's got like Jed Peterson in the main part. And I've always admired this actor a lot. So this gets a major happy face. I love Metropolitan Playhouse. Yes. They just find the most amazing plays to put on. And in the tiniest space, they do the most incredibly brilliant work. I know with incredible production values and everything else. It's just really go see this. At Theater for a New Audience in Brooklyn, you could see a rarely produced Shakespeare play, um, Timon of Athens, which stars Catherine Hunter as Timon, a role usually played by a man. But here, she's a very rich uh, party giver, and she's lavish and generous to all her friends. Um, but when her funds run out, so do her friends. The only ones who stay kind of faithful to her are her servants. She retreats to the forest and lives as a hermit. And then there's another reversal of fortune when she finds a buried treasure. Uh, what will she do? Will she support uh, revolutionaries who want to bring down the town? Uh, it's a really interesting play about reversals of fortune and about how, you know, some people are only friendly for the money. And it's really, really, really well done. And Catherine Hunter is brilliant. And so is Arnie Burton, who plays a total misanthrope as well. Um, it's definitely worth the trip to Brooklyn to see. I'm giving it a happy face. Forbidden Broadway, The Next Generation is at the York. Yes, after a hiatus, Forbidden Broadway is back. Thank God. And... I'm, I talked to a lot of people at the opening night party, so I'm going to have that after we talk about other stuff. But they make fun of Hades Town and Moulin Rouge and Evan Hansen and Fosse Verdon. And there's even a bit about Jeremy Pope and Renee Zellweger as Judy Garland and Fiddler in Yiddish. They even have plays like The Ferryman. This is wonderful. And Gerard Alessandrini and the cast... Chris Collins Pisano, Emmanuel Houston, Aline May uh, Goyesha. Oh my gosh, Goyesha. <laughs> uh, 
Jenny Lee Stern and Joshua Tertian are wonderful. And Fred Barton, who was with her, uh, Forbidden Broadway at the very beginning, does the piano. So, I mean, it was wonderful. Maya Goisha, I think. Um, yeah, it's, it's the most brilliant, loving satire of Broadway that you could imagine. And it's dancier than ever. These are the incredibly talented people, including a kid this time. So, um, you know, definitely make sure if you love Broadway at all, you've got to see it. A, the Happy Face Plus, and you can he hear them talking about it later. I also have some footage from Romeo and Bernadette, uh, which is an Amaz production. I went to the press conference for this, and Jan and I are going to talk about it on our next show. But, oh my gosh, it's what would happen if Romeo and Juliet had a happier ending. And he wakes up after this long sleep, Romeo, and he's in Brooklyn, and he thinks Bernadette, who is the daughter of a mafia, is really Juliet. So you have, like, mafia, you know, rival mafia action, which, you know, parallels Capulet and Montague. And you've got some incredible songs by... Um, Mark Saltzman did the book and lyrics, and the music is adapted from classic Italian melodies, but with the 60s pop. It is wonderful. Me and Jan will rave about it next show, but now you can hear it now when I show you it all. Jan and I are giving it a happy face. Plus, 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 plus. And now from the opening night of Forbidden Broadway, I talk to the cast and the writer-director. Chris Collins Pisano. Oh my gosh, is it, is it a dream of yours to be in Forbidden Broadway? Oh my god, it's like the greatest theatrical experience of my life. I, it's like getting paid to have fun, you know? And you get to, instead of just being in Hello, Dolly, you get to do Phil in Hello, you get to be in 20 Broadway. No, oh, it's incredible. Just character after character and costume after costume. I wish we could put a camera backstage so you could see how much running around we're doing back there. Because it's, it's insane. It's like its own show backstage. I know. You have wonderful breath control. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. It's gotten better by running around so much. It's like my only workout. Start with uh, Josh Turchin. So how did you, I mean, we finally got a kid in Forbidden Broadway. It's perfect because of a Dear Evan Hansen. How did you get hooked into this? Well, I actually did a reading with Gerard in, like, 2018 for a show he wrote called La La Land, which was kind of a parody of La La Land, but not. And then after that, he contacted me a few months later and said, hey, we're doing a tribute to Carol Channing. Um, would you like to be in it? And it was at 54 Below, and I actually played young Gerard, which is amazing. And then I would say... During, my, I wrote a cabaret series, and during one of the shows, or the latest one, he's he told me and my mom, hey, I want to talk to you about something, we'll do it over phone, and, or he told my mom about something, and then I heard that I was going to be doing the next written Broadway, the next written Broadway, and now I'm here. Oh my god, maybe you'll get to do the real Evan Hansen when they see you do it. Maybe. Wouldn't that be funny? That would be hilarious. <laughs> Gerard Alessandrini. So, of all the things you get to make fun of, what, 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 how do you, how do you come up with this? Well, uh, uh, I mean, I went to some of these shows, like The Ferryman in Oklahoma, and I thought, oh, I have to spoof this. I just have to spoof it. They were, they were wonderful shows, very dramatic, but very spoofable because they were so dramatic. And I had a good time, and the cast was great, and the oh, scene was great, you know? I mean, that's what, you know, with Oklahoma and... And, and, the, and the Fiddler in Yiddish and all the Moulin Rouge and Beetlejuice, all that. So that, that's what makes a good Forbidden Broadway, a good season. Jenny Lee Stern is a major talent. I've worked with her before in one of the other Forbidden Broadways, Forbidden Broadway Alive and Kicking, and she guest starred in Spamilton, my other spoof show of Hamilton. So uh, I worked with her so I knew where her strengths were, and she can do anything anyway. And then the other actors, yeah, great voices, great comic timing, good actors, good dancers, real triple threats, all of them. Oh, my. Jenny Lee Stern. I was just talking about how you really built that Judy Garland, the way you belted out, I mean, and, and Mary Test. I mean, my God, how many different roles did you play? Thirteen. Wow. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing. And the show, we always say the show backstage is like the second show when you see us frantically ripping off wigs and costumes and trying to, you know, in 30 seconds rearrange your voice to jump back out and do something totally different it's amazing it just is so great and so 
I think, you know, like we always say, we shove with love. So oh, you absolutely do. The, the passion for the people come through, and, you know, it's our valentine to them, so. We are with Aline Mayagoitia. And how did you get hooked into this hysterical silliness? Um, I got an email to co audition, so I had 24 hours to come up with, you know, eight different impressions, some specifically that they asked for, and some that, you know, you just whip out over your hat. Um, and then I showed up, and then a day later I started rehearsals. So it was, I think what it is is when you grow up as a musical theater nerd, and also in the age of YouTube, like I have spent too many hours watching these people and like when you're little and you just want to be on stage like you just imitate what you know um and what you see and then to do this you just kind of yank it up to 11 you know um and suddenly you're like oh yeah i have been doing a bernadette peters impression all my life because like i'm obsessed with bernadette peters you know you already know it hi emmanuel houston Oh my god, you get to do Andre the Shield. I mean, he is beyond, he, he's perfect for this because he's over the top in real life. Yes, yes he is. I, uh, I've always been a big fan of his, especially because of Ain't Misbehaving. So I, there's like the entire show of Ain't Misbehaving back when Andre the Shields was in it that I watch on YouTube all the time when I was younger. <laughs> so being able to do this is pretty cool. I think, um, okay, so the Billy Porter one. That moment came because during my callback, um, Billy, the Tonys had just happened, and Billy Porter, uh, that video went viral of Billy Porter singing um, Everything's Coming Up Roses at the Tonys. Um, he played like musical theater karaoke or something like that. And so I walked into my audition callback, and they were like, all right, what are you going to sing? And I was like, I'm going to do a Billy Porter impersonation singing Everything's Coming Up Roses. Fast forward, I booked the show, and I walk into rehearsal, he was like, so remember when you did that impersonation? I wrote a song because of that impersonation, so now we're going to put it in the show. So that's really cool, I've always thought. <laughs> oh, wow, you inspired him! Yeah, there's a lot of, like, give and take with Gerard, um, where cause sometimes he'll put something out, and he'll be like, this is what I have an idea of, it's just a sketch, but here's what you get. Give me ideas, what do you do best, you know what I mean? So if, if he thinks something, if we know that we do something really well, he'll turn around and write something real quick and be like, all right, here you go, you know? And now some musical numbers from Romeo and Bernadette, which Jan and I just loved. Oh, no, 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 no,
situation flashed through hot. You deny that you've grown a pearl. I cannot. Any guy hanging around or watch his ass get shot. Wanna bet? Just a game you never met. The entire uh, Forbidden Broadway and Romeo and Bernadette can be found on YouTube, Eva Heinemann. Assemble is this uh, immersive thing going on. That looks good. I'm going to go and see what that's all about. Matthew Bourne Swan Lake is at New York City Center. And oh my gosh, I saw it decades ago. It's brilliant. Pac Rat is a brilliant puppet show. Brecht is always good. 17 minutes looks very interesting. Sister Calling My Name, a Love Storm Theater. Titus Burgess and a lot of cool friends will be giving a tribute to Sondheim at Carnegie Hall, February 1st. Shayna Farr, Julie Andrews, February 4th. League of Professional Women has Irene Dandy talking February 10th. It's free at New York Public Library. Origins First Irish Festival still going on. Catch the wonderful Richard Skipper at Green Room on February 8th at noon. And his birthday is going... Uh, oh, and uh, Jerry Herman and lots of good, cool stuff going on at 54 Below. And, um, let's see. Yeah, Lori Beachman, Jennifer Pace on Richard Skipper's birthday, February 11th. And Medea's over at BAM. And, um... Oh, it here is um, Edward Einhorn's um, Dr. James and Alexander. Uh, that's February 15th, it ends. And we love our 5099. Planet Connections Theater Festivities has got um, Jose Rivera and other wonderful plays going on at 14th Street Y. Paradise Lost, we'll talk about our next show, but you can read the review of Mark already on Facebook. And we'll talk about these on our next show. And go to Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for even more on high drama. And these shows have closed. So you can read the review on Facebook. Pick up your Performing Arts Insider, the Cultural Harpy in New York City. Our next show will be February 15th. And don't forget to go to Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for even more on our shows.